Hello everybody and welcome back to our uh, production gear and camera talk segment here at Tested. I'm Joey Famelli and today I'll be talking about the Blackmagic Ursa mini line of cameras uh, as well as the digital film space in which these cameras shoot in. For this last month, I've been shooting a bunch with this 4.6K Mini. I took it on a bunch of tested shoots. Uh, I did some, some shoots where I got to like light the environment and try it out there. Uh, I took it on some of our like actuality style shoots where I was just using it as a shoulder rig and kind of doing some running gun style. And lastly, I've been taking it out just kind of in nature, uh, like pure documentary style, uh, harsh lighting, just, just a natural environment. And as I was compiling my notes and all of my thoughts about this camera, Blackmagic has a press conference and they released uh, a brand new version of this camera, an updated version that actually addresses a lot of the issues that I have with this camera, um, specifically kind of the accessibility of the buttons and, and um, the built-in functions that this camera lacks. It looks like they are trying to fix that with this new camera, the Ursa Mini 4.6K Pro. So let's talk about this camera for a minute. I think the image is great. I love the picture. Uh, you got 15 stops of dynamic range, which uh, we will talk about much more in a little bit. But as a, as a, like a shoulder camera, I expected a little bit more built-in functionality. Um, a lot of shoulder cams these days kind of come with built-in ND filters. This does not have that. You need to buy you know, separate filters to put on your lenses if you really want to do that. Um, it's pretty bare bones as far as like the button placement goes. I love the touch LCD screen to cycle through menus. I think that's fantastic. Um, but the overall button placement's a little wonky. It's not that easy just to kind of fine tune, just use this thing as like a keypad and kind of fine tune a situation as, as sees fit. The new camera, the new Ursa Mini 4.6K Mini Pro, uh, that camera has all this stuff. It has the built-in ND filters, um, much more thought out button placements for uh, running gun shooters. So this camera here, it really, it really shines on set. Uh, it really shines on sets that have been kind of taking the time to set up and do lighting and um, you know really help the image pop especially because of all that uh, uh, the latitude you have and all that room you have in post-production to work with. The versatility of this camera is a little bit limited because like I said because of those functionalities that is lacking and the just the kind of awkwardness of the buttons I, I wouldn't take this on a documentary style shoot or any kind of like actuality on the on the run stuff. This is this is a camera that I would use on very specific sets. Uh, the new camera, like I said, it, it seeks to, to solve that issue and make it a much more versatile ENG or you know, shoulder rig uh, camera by uh, addressing all the stuff. I haven't used it yet, but um, you know, that's what it looks like it's trying to accomplish. I'll try it out in the future and, and give you my thoughts there. All that being said, the image and the sensor on both this camera and the newer version of it are essentially the same. Uh, which is fine, because that's what I really want to talk about with you guys today was the, uh, the Blackmagic digital film image. So you may have heard me talk about flat color profiles, or like log profiles in the past. Now, what that is, is the camera is capturing like this almost gray, washed out looking image. And what it's trying to do is uh, take advantage of the, uh, of a larger dynamic range that the camera can get. Uh, so you get much more latitude um, that you can take that stuff in post and manipulate the image there with a lot of options. Now, what video cameras do is uh, they, they almost, Add a color profile kind of baked into the camera. They'll, you know, they'll adjust the adjust the curves, adjust the contrast, the saturation, so that you get this nice looking image kind of out of the box. What happens is if you take that on the post production or down the line, and if you're going to like a color grading suite, uh, you may realize that you don't have many options within the blacks and the whites because of that that curve and contrast has been adjusted, and you may have like clipped blacks or clipped whites and your options for manipulation of that image starts to become a little uh, more limited. So what the flat and, the, and the, uh, the log profiles are doing are giving you much more options um, within those two ranges. When we're talking about like latitude, uh, we're talking about the, the range from, from black to white and how much data kind of is captured in those. So if you think about the flat profile, it's, it's kind of bringing everything down, but all that data is still there so that in post you can adjust the contrast and bring the blacks to what you want, maybe, maybe adjust those mid-levels. You just have a lot of options to do in post. That's the benefit of, of shooting with flat profiles. It takes a little bit of time to get used to and learn how to do correctly, um, 
but that is kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about flat or log profiles. Okay, so here we are in uh, DaVinci Resolve 12.5. Uh, this is a color correction and color grading program that I use to handle a lot of these clips. Uh, the light version of this software is, is free, so if you want to kind of dabble into it, it had, does have um, some editing capabilities and, uh, you know, mostly it's known for its color corrector and color grading application here, which is um, it's really powerful and then it's, it's a lot of fun to, to learn and use if you're into this stuff. But uh, uh, let me show you kind of my workflow and what I do with these clips and talk a little bit more about this, um, you know, all the stuff I've been talking about with these, these log profiles. So uh, all this stuff here was shot with the Ursa uh, Mini 4.6K, all in Apple ProRes 422 HQ. Uh, you have the option to do like DNX HD if you use Windows. I use Macs, so this uh, ProRes is great for me. There's also RAW, I shot a little bit of RAW and, um, uh, and doing, some, doing some exposure tests, which we'll get into momentarily. But let me show you how I start off with, with these clips. Here's, some, here's a shot of my cat. This is shot in that, in that flat profile. You can add a LUT. So what I did was I added a lookup. It's called a LUT. It's a lookup table and it has, it's, it's essentially an adjustment that you, um, it's already kind of baked in. It's a look baked in. And I have that loaded into the monitor on the Ursa. So when I'm, when I, when I'm looking at the shot through the viewfinder, uh, I can hit a button and see what it would look like with a lookup table. So let me show you the lookup table applied here in post. So I'm gonna add, a few nodes here. These are all uh, serial nodes. If you think of it in terms of like, uh, you know, kind of here's your starting point here. Here's the image. It comes in any adjustment you do on this node. You, know, you can do a different adjustment on the next node and and so on. And what's what's going on is um, it works kind of sequentially. So this node, the, you know, the adjustments kind of baking in. You do your adjustment on the next node based off of what that earlier node did and so on. So you can kind of play with certain looks um, in a certain way depending on what you did in the previous node. So let's reset these crazy curves. Uh, now I'm going to add the LUT to this last node here and I'll explain why in a second. But let's go down to the three LUT. So you can make your own. I made my own that I've been using. Um, uh, this is what I've been using on like a monitor. So I'll hit a button, I'll load, you know, load the load up, the, uh, load the LUT up in the camera, hit, hit this button, I'll see this, hit the button again, and I'll go back to flat and kind of see what, what, like everything that's being, that's being captured. But one LUT I've been really liking is, um, this guy Daniel Peters made a few LUTs here. So let's, let's start with his, uh, cause I want to do some more tweaking on mine. Let's just start with his base. So he's done quite a few. So as you can see here, he's done like, Stylized LUTs like Bay, uh, Cream, Film, you know, Film Emulation, you know, Peach. All these that kind of have different looks to them. So uh, let's say Bay. I'm guessing it's like a Michael Bay, you know, very cinematic, heavy on like the the colors and the shadows and the the colors obviously kind of the whole color cast there. And then if I wanted to bring you know, tone that down a bit, let's say it's a little, little heavy on the green for me. I, I like the overall contrast of it. So I can go to an earlier node here and adjust the color contrast. Now what's so like I said, everything's moving sequentially. So that last node, me adding the LUT there was intentional so that I can go back to these previous nodes and adjust the image so that by the time the LUT does its thing, uh, LUTs are you know uh, most of the time very aggressive on the look that they're trying to do. So me going back, I can kind of say like, oh, that you know the, the LUT's great, but the blacks are real crushed. I'm going to try to just bring them back up a little bit. So I'll go to this earlier node here and maybe bring in some of that black detail back and then bring in some of the white detail back as well. So basically like just reducing that kind of S curve that it gave it and it's starting to washed out and what I'm doing here, but you get, the, you get the idea. So you can make adjustments to the LUT based on making adjustments to the previous nodes. So, okay, let's get out of this Michael Bay one. Let's just go with the LUT that I like the, um, the base here. Reset this guy up. And now if we want to be, um, if we want to be a little more organized, we can name these guys. So this last one is the, what? I'm gonna use this middle node for color. And this first node I'm going to use for my curves. Now, I have to delete this old one here. So what I can do now, so right now I have three nodes. Curves and colors, there's nothing going on here. It's There's just a LUT, but this setup here is something I'm gonna use for all these clips. So I'm gonna, what's called grabbing a still here and 
Now, if I go to this next clip of my cat, uh, hang out on the, on the bar here, I can add a node and then just drag the still here and it brings everything over. So it's just kind of a easy way to give yourself a starting point and then work from there. So let's go back over to this guy here. Okay, so the let's do this thing. Uh, I, I can see that I'm losing information here in the whites on his, on his fur and also back here a little bit. So if I wanted to try and bring that back, um, I'm gonna go to my curves and you, know, you can do this in any of like the color wheels. Um, you, know, you get a lot of options for your levels. You, you got your primary wheels, your gain, gamma and lift. That's all, you know, highlight. So like right there, like I'm adjusting the gain down and, and you can already see that the fur is starting to come back. Um, you know, we can do that over here in the curves and kind of have a little more granular control over every element of the image and bring in some bring the blacks a little bit. I don't know if I quite want the high contrast for this scene. So, you know, something like that's a little softer, a little more pleasant on the, uh, the cat. Um, so let's, let's disable the curves. And that's what we started with, with the LUT. Me going back to the curves, make that adjustment. I'm getting that. And you can see the fur there. I'm bringing detail back into the image. Um, you know, and this obviously with the LUT, that's, that's a perfectly good image. And that's kind of what you'll get with a lot of cameras. Like uh, if this camera was just kind of a traditional video camera that didn't have any flat or log profile capabilities, this is, my, th this is something that you might get. Now, what happens there, like I was talking about earlier, is you, 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 these clipped whites and these clipped blacks, that stuff's, that stuff's gone. And if, uh, if I didn't have that flat capability, I couldn't adjust that stuff. I couldn't change the image and bring that stuff back. Uh, as you can see, I'm now, I'm now messing with a node after the LUT. So this LUT, that uh, all of those corrections are already baked in, and now, now I'm trying to bring it back, and it's not there. So I can do my best, to like di you know, dole it out, but you know, it's gone. And that's kind of the advantage. That's the advantage of those flat profiles is that you just you start off with something a little more raw, and you can make every decision. You can use the LUTs to kind of like guide you in the right direction, or you know, if you just want, like I said, the, this LUT looks perfectly fine out of the box. I can just apply that and go, or, you know, if somebody really wanted some like, softer look, some of the details back, then I can, I can make that ad adjustment there. All right, so now let's go to this color. So let's say I, uh, I wanted a little bit of a color cast. I'm a little warm, so it's just, I'm, I'm bad with, with the color end of color correction, <laughs> which is unfortunate. But, uh, all right, so, you know, there's a, there's a color, let's just say that. This is that a client wants that. A client wants their cat to look kind of, sunset-ish on sitting on the bar and uh and me having this stuff organized if they changed their mind and said hey we want something actually crazy and purple and alien then i can just go to this color i know where where color adjustments are being made go to this note here and then change that purple um then you can see there's the curves the color cast and the LUT, and then Go over to the next scene here, and I want to I want to match those shots. Uh, da Vinci has like you know I can either just grab this still and then apply it here, or just press this, the equals uh, hotkey, and it'll pull all of the last clips information over. So kind of a quick way to, to match up your clip. So cat looks, camera, and then we cut to the shot or something. You know you get the idea. All right, so let's uh, let's change gears here and take a look at this scene here that I shot at Adam's shop with Frank and Sean. So I can already tell from the Ursa Mini that I, I had this a little bit underexposed. So let's try to correct it. Let's try to bring it back. So I'm gonna add a, a node. I'm gonna bring in the, the setup I have here with the LUT and the curves and the color. And yeah, it's a little dark. So let's start with curves and just bring back in some of those mids. That's kind of what I want. Maybe the blacks are, are okay. Let's bring them down a little bit. So you can see that I'm adjusting like Frank's head there because he kind of, he's you know a little bit closer to the light. But I need to match him and Sean a little bit better. All right, so let's just start there. So um, skin's a little pale. So let's, let's go over to the color tab here and see if we can bring in some skin tones to him. Now you can see as I adjust that gain, so I, I can go to log and like, and just, just adjust 
die areas there, but let's let's say I just kind of want to bring all of the the a bigger end of the of the highlights up towards a warmer color. Now you can see I've I'm actually I'm leaking into the mids quite a bit with that warm tone, so we can um, compensate for that by bringing the gamma the opposite direction, and maybe the the lift as well. Let's bring a little bit of more of a bluish into those shadows. Lift the skin back up to the skin tone. So, I mean, it's a, a little stylized. I mean, we could work on this for a while and get it to something else, but let's just let's just go there. So you see you see what I did with the color as I disable and, and re-enable it. Um, kind of has a, like a green, like a greenish tint, probably from like the fluorescence in, in Adam's shop. Um, and then I, I just did my best to kind of take it to uh, something a little more natural as far as as far as um, skin tones. All right, so let's move on down the line here. Now, I I needed to shoot the product stuff of the camera with a different camera, but um, you this it uses the same kind of color space as the Black Magic. This is the Black Magic uh, Pocket Cinema camera that I shot this with, and uh, it also shoots in a, a flat profile. Um, but you would need to get like a you would end up it, you need to find some different LUTs for it or some different lookup tables that have been designed specifically for that camera. But let's let's just kind of show you how some of the workflow is. Let's add the serial node. Let's bring in this. Now this is this is bringing in the um, 4.6K LUT, and hey, it doesn't look too bad. But um, I mean, that's totally usable. But let's try let's try another pocket LUT that I have. Uh, Matt's BMC base. Oh, let's do 3.2. Um, yeah. Let's do base two. Okay, so this probably looks a little more closer to what the um, the environment was. I had like daylight hitting this camera, uh, hitting this wooden table that was bouncing back up here, and and then I had like tungsten style uh, practicals in the background. So, um, you know that right there, totally fine as is. But you know, let's say I wanted to like really make these highlights pop. I uh, go to my curves. Let's bring it a little bit, and then just kind of bring that black points down a bit. And maybe I wanted to make the highlights a little more blue. So let's go over to log and just hit those, those shiny parts and then just drag the slider. You can see it's kind of leaking on the table because the table is very bright. And it also starts to mess with the lights in the background here too. But um, I should have done that in the color node, but yeah, whatever. So there you go. Uh, similar, similar workflow. This is a little, you know, blue, orange kind of product look going on here, but, uh, you know, you can also let me add one more note. Let me show you one more cool little thing about DaVinci, which is hard to do in Premiere. You can do, you can actually do a lot of the stuff in Premiere. You can add LUTs, uh, and then adjust your levels, bef you know, in the layer before the, the LUT and make adjustments there. But DaVinci actually comes with a lot of really cool things like, you know, masks. So let's say, let's say I didn't like how bright that table is. So that's, I can take a mask pretty easily. And just bring the bring the offset down. So yeah, something like that. I don't know why it's still so blue. Bring that back to its regular color. Alright, so there you go. There's there's a mask that's, you know, doing an attempt to kind of bring that table down, make it a little more like mood lighting. This is like, looks like a, now we're getting to like, you know, a midnight shooting session of, you know, moonlight coming through a window on the camera and uh, I got a few practicals on the workshop. All right. So that's, you know, if you want to go that route. So you, you can see that the range of this camera is actually pretty good. So I, when I, I took this camera out, outdoors and I didn't have any ND filters uh, made for the lenses that I had. I was using a lot of like Rokinon lenses and I didn't have ND filters for, for them for some reason or other. I think they're still up at the San Francisco office. Um, so I was basically just shooting pretty closed down. I think this was like f-stop 22 or 16 or something. Um, but you can see like the, it, it, I, I really had a situation where I was blowing out. If I closed that thing down quite a bit, I can still get a lot of stuff like, you know, yeah, I didn't, I didn't need that ND filter on all the time. It'd be nice to have a built-in ND to just 
you know, bring it down so I can get the exposure that I wanted. But in this scenario, it was fine. And you can see like that, you know, really kicks in that the, the detail everywhere. The clouds saw a lot of detail, the, the ocean, you know, there's a little bit of highlights out here that you can kind of stylize if you want a little more. So if I went the curves and like, this is probably something you'd get from, you know, like a video camera, essentially. It's just like the video camera that had everything kind of going for it. You have to, you have to choose your exposure. If you want to expose for the clouds then you're going to get dark, uh, you know, dark mountains here. If you want to expose for the mountains, then you're going to have, you know, a blown out sky. Um, but in this case, you have the option of, of, you know, just giving it a gentle S curve in the way that you want. Let's say I want to bring the mids down while the highs up and then bring in the mountains just a tad. And then maybe add a little bit of contrast just to make it pop. And maybe, maybe it's a little too blue. Maybe let's just pretend it's just a little bit warmer of a day. You know, you get the idea. You get, you start off with that and you can make the adjustments all day long. Uh, so one last thing I wanted to do was a camera test. So, um, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to see what I can do with overexposed images. So you can always, you should always expose properly. Um, there, you know, there's no excuse to have uh, a misexposed image, but let's say that you got a bunch of footage back from this camera and, uh, it was overexposed to different extents. So I wanted to see what, how far I can, um, how far I can go before the image completely breaks. Um, I did a light meter here. I, I did the light meter and it told me I wanted to be at, I think F22. Um, from what I remember, a lot of people working with the Ursa suggest going over, uh, moving up one stop. So instead of 22, I started off with 16. So, uh, so this here is 16, uh, this is 11, this is eight, and this is 5.6. Um, and I wanted to see what I, I wanted to see if I can bring it back. So let's, let's like one stop at a time. So let's, let's try it here. So let's bring in the, the workflow. Now let's, um, it's, it looks a little under to me. I probably should have even exposed higher, but let's, let's just bring it to something that I like. All right. So let's say that is where I want it to be. Uh, let, let's say I corrected the image and this was the, this was the shot, but for some reason the next shot was overexposed. So let's see what I can do. So you can see to just with just the lookup table, uh, actually, let's just give it the exact same. I'm going to give it the exact same settings as I did here with the, the equals button. Just apply everything from the clip before, and that's what we get. That is one stop overexposed. Um, so let's hit those curves and see what we can do to fix it. Let's reset them. So that's pretty good. Like, if you look at those two clips together, um, you know, I'm sure you can start to pick out slight color detail, but like just to, to look at it, one stop overexposed. Um, let's we'll go to the raw. Here is previous clip. Here's this clip. So those two clips became that. Now let's try for two stops over. Um, let's see. This one's going to be a little trickier. All right, let's, let's take in the last setting. Yep. Yep. That's that overexposed. Now we're starting the sky is starting to get a little, a little real light blue. Might be losing some color. Okay, so now it's getting a little tougher. Now you can see, if you look at the sky, the sky's um, just changing a little bit of color. Um, you know, the, the image is obviously starting to become a little more shallow depth of field as that iris opens up. So the trees are just changing in nature. Um, but you can see those, the part of my forehead, my chin that are just out. Um, you know, those are going to be hard to recover from, but worst case scenario, I think you could probably do some, um, like take this loss, this loss of detail and loss of data and, and change it. So it's not so, um, blaringly white. Uh, but for this example, we'll, we'll skip that. All right. So in this one, and this one's obviously gone. <laughs> There's, you can see here, it's just, it's clipped. The, the whites are mostly clipped. Um, not a whole lot you can do here. Whew. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't one that I'm going to be able to recover from. But 
those two stops, being able to match those pretty well, uh, started, like I said, started to lose a little bit during that third stop. Uh, and then the fourth stop was just gone. But knowing that you kind of, you, you and consider it the other way as well. Like if we went, if we went low, I mean, you start getting a little bit of, um, you know, some, some noise in the lows as you start underexposing. Uh, but you saw what, like what we did with Sean and Frank, you can, you can bring up the image to be, um, a little more exposed if you were under a stop. So if you consider that 16 was what it told us to be, uh, and we were shooting at F22, you know, we would have room to come back up to where we should be there. Uh, and then if we went one stop over, we can recover pretty nicely. And then two, it's a little trickier, but, but knowing that we have that, that range and that room is something that, um, not a lot of colors or not, not a lot of cameras that do, um, built in color profiles can have the capability of doing and, and every log and every flat profile handles this stuff much differently. So I'll, uh, I've just been running these little minor tests with the Ursa just to see how how I can recover from um, you know unsavory situations. Uh, but every camera is different, and um, you know, like I said, if you if you are shooting with this stuff yourself, you should you know jump into DaVinci Resolve and kind of develop your own LUTs to compensate for um, exactly what the camera lacks or what what its strengths are. Um, and it's, it's kind of important to do run these kind of camera tests and to, to really know, you know, really know the camera you're going to be shooting with if you're going to be taking uh, on a, you know, irreplaceable shoot or if you're going to be using it on some kind of film. It's really good to do these tests and just to understand what your, your camera's doing. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for coming with me on this journey through the Blackmagic Cinema Camera Line and the digital film space. Uh, this is a whole concept that kind of sold me on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera a couple years back. Um, I was really interested in the color science of cameras and, and learning some higher caliber color correction. And that camera specifically has been a great tool for me to experiment and play around with. And I highly suggest if you are interested in any of this stuff, check and see if your camera has like a log profile, a you know, C-log or Sony S-log. And uh, shoot some stuff and play around with it in post and see kind of what your camera is, is doing. Kind of learn more about your camera's brains. Um, if you have any questions, Shoot them to me. I will do my best to answer. And uh, thank you guys for watching. I will see you guys next time. We have a couple more things lined up. I'm going to be doing some, some LED lighting stuff with the uh, Aperture uh, lights. And I got a whole media management video I'm working on with uh, our RAID systems and, and our Synology servers and how we kind of archive and media manage. So keep an eye out for that stuff. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you.